Morning. Ready for our trip? There's, the there's no coach. <laughs> Here we are outside the guilds, I'm just 15 minutes late, uh, but we're 20 minutes late. Uh, we've got a lot of students on the coach uh, and it's about to happen. Uh, can you just do that health and safety announcement again please John? <laughs> oh okay, cool. Well, do you wanna, you can, if you want to come in and have a listen to the talks and stuff as well. Oh, what's we could, it, what's we could, it about? Uh, a, a, a bit about um, the museum itself, which is a pottery factory, uh, and then a bit about the donor intention behind the charity that now holds uh, a collection. <laughs> we put you up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I might pop in, you know. Yeah. And then, uh, yeah, well, if you come with us, then you'll just be in our group, so you'll be fine, yeah. Cool. Google Maps say it can take about um, an hour and a half, what do you reckon? It just, if, if the yeah, yeah, it will be okay. It might be even less. It's I thought even less, yeah. Because it, it, it often gets it wrong, doesn't it? Yeah, it's not far off um, Junction 15. Oh. Because of the height restriction, we've just got to go a little bit around just so we can get into the museum. But this time, we should be okay. Yeah. It's just the M6 because of the 50 mile an hour with the road works, it takes a bit longer sometimes. We're going to um, start the talk a bit later. I'm interested in the fact that all went insolvent. Uh, they don't know that. <laughs> so they're going to have a surprise when we start talking about where they went bust. Um, that is what's interesting about it. It's a very valuable collection. And it almost got lost because it wasn't held properly on trust. Um, it was held just by the company as an asset. So when it went bust, it almost went to the creditors. Um, when 
um, your tutor's approach with a, a visit here um, to say that from the University of Liverpool, I said I'm really happy to be today because in 2013 I graduated from the University of Liverpool in the history department. So it's very nice to see Liverpool University um, hats and sweatshirts and I like that. So anyway, welcome to the museum. Um, I am going to talk to you for about 20 minutes, really, really quickly, about why the museum is important, um, which will lead on to like, your latest discussions today. So I'm going to whiz through 250 years as quickly as I can, picking out some really important factors. So, um, the Wedgwood Museum is one of the oldest industrial museums in the country. It was founded in 1906. And the man down there is our original curator, and occasionally we still get phone calls, especially from places like China, and um, asking to speak to the museum curator Isaac. We have to explain he's been dead for about 18 years, but nevertheless, we're here to help. Um, but many of these items are really unique in the sense that when um, this museum was founded, it was based upon the fact that they'd been exploring the original factory at Etruria, and they'd uncovered this sort of hidden room that was full of old pots and documents. And from there, because the family was still very heavily involved in the money for the business, they thought we need to do something with this, we need to put this on display. So um, a lot of these old pots and um, items were found on the work, e.g. they went around the factory saying, this looks old and interesting, we'll have it for the museum. And um, that practice continues today. We still have regular trawls around the factory taking pieces into our collection to preserve them um, for posterity's sake. Um, so if there are other pieces in here that I recognise still in the museum, um, that item I recognise, um, the Portland vase down there, a couple of these busts at the top, they are still on display after 112 years. However, we're not just a museum, uh, we also hold the Wedgwood Museum archives. Now this is the bit that I look after, this is where you normally find me. It doesn't look the most visually exciting place, but in those uh, boxes there are 250 years of material. Anything from original letters from the Wedgwood family, and I'll touch on those a bit more later. Um, orders going back to the 18th century, original catalogues, um, shape books, price listings. Um, anything and everything you can think of, you can probably find in the museum archives. And really uniquely, and this is something that is only for the archives and not for the museum collection itself, um, the museum archives were recognised by the UK Memory of the World programme as being one of the most complete ceramic manufacturing archives in existence, encompassing all of those various factors which I won't go through but unparalleled in its diversity and breadth uh, from 80,000 plus documents, that figure's wrong. I think it should be at least two or three times that probably, um, which embrace every imaginable subject from pot to people, transport to trade, society and um, social conditions. So that's really special. Only a very few uh, places in the UK actually hold this Memory of the World programme and um, world to significance. Um, some documents that are also included within this Memory of the World um, documents being of really important national um, importance include the execution warrant of Charles I and um, some of the papers I think of Florence Nightingale, so we are on that level in terms of historical importance. <coughs> so talking about the family papers, because we are family and a business archive, um, I'll just run through some of these very quickly. But we have the papers of Josiah Wedgwood, who was our founder. The company was founded in 1759, um, but we do have letters that predate that as well. We have um, letters uh, from his wife over here, Sarah, um, and then a little bit further down the family tree, um, the family gets involved in a lot of different things. So the gentleman um, in black and white, in the third one across, is one of uh, Josiah Wedgwood's sons, his name is Tom Wedgwood, and he's been recognised um, now as being the father of English photography because of his early experiments with transferring images. So we have very few papers related to those experiments, but more broadly related to his life, we have all that archive here. You might possibly recognise the gentleman right at the far end, that is Charles Darwin, and the Wedgwood-Darwin link is because uh, Charles Darwin is the grandson of Josiah Wedgwood. So Wedgwood's eldest daughter married into the Darwin family and their youngest son in turn was Charles. 
we actually have a letter here in the archive um, written by young Charles um, Darwin to his uncle Josiah II, basically complaining that his father would let him go off on this amazing round-the-world trip that he'd been promised. Um, uncle Josiah writes to Charles Darwin's father and says, we've got one letter. And that, of course, is the voyage of the Beagle and everything else from there sort of continues. So that's, again, really interesting. We have later family members as well. So you've got here um, Godfrey Wedgwood, who really sort of kept the factory going in those difficult years we had in the Victorian period. And um, Cecil down here is a man that I've been doing a lot of work on. And he was the managing director from about 1902 to 1916, um, at which point he was killed in the Battle of the Somme. Um, again, interesting historical links with that. And then finally, the man at the bottom is Josiah Wedgwood V, who was imported in locating the factory from Victoria where it had been and then moving it over here to Barsford into the clean, fresh air with all the facilities that would offer. So just to sort of give you some idea of how important the collection is and how the archives and the museum sort of tie together, um, these two items are actually on display next door in the museum and these are known as the first day's vases. These are the only items in the museum we can say hand on heart or actually thrown by Josiah Wedgwood himself in 1769, and they celebrate the very first day's production at his factory at Chichoria. However, the archive also contains the original shape book, so you've actually seen the shape of the first day's vase and the original books from which Wedgwood lifted the designs in order to stick on his own vases as well. So these are contemporary prints in the 18th century, which then Wedgwood then used um, for himself. We have, so again, some of my favourite things in the archive. Um, Desire Wedgwood's Commonplace Book, which is basically his notebook of interesting things you just want to forget. So this one is a really interesting page. Um, it contains his listings for um, the rules of his workforce, basically, in the 18th century. And some of those items include no football, no graffiti on the wall. Um, but he's also sort of very aware um, of issues like um, lead poisoning in the ceramic industry, because lead was used in glazes. Um, in certain departments where this dust sort of settled on the floor, they didn't sweep it up, they mopped it up, so they weren't kicking all this dust back into the air, people were breathing it in. Um, but certainly, really important things like um, 18th century factory management, something that you wouldn't necessarily associate with our archives, can be found here. But also tucked away um, over there at the very far end is his recipe for making slow wine, because why not make a note of that for the sake? We also have a, a really important set of documents, which is perhaps over a thousand or so letters between Thomas <coughs> Bentley, who was Josiah Wedgwood's business partner, and Wedgwood, which lasts, this sort of um, partnership lasts from 1769 to 1780, with the letters extend for that as well. And basically they were corresponding virtually every single day on business matters, on family matters, they were gossiping about the latest news, they were sharing their scientific ideas, and these documents survived in the archive. Unfortunately, we do not have Bentley's responses. We only have Wedgwood's letters to him. So where those letters have gone um, in the 200 or so years since uh, Wedgwood passed away, we have no idea. But nevertheless, there are fascinating recording of two men's lives in the 18th century. Among other things we have, we have a huge amount of employee record. It's not just sort of like the managing directors of the company. So um, this is a photo album of people um, of workers on the factory at Etoria, taken in um, 1898. Um, you can see this is oh, I'm not very well. This is Isaac Cook, the museum director, down here again. You might just see he's balancing one of the carefully that bus on one knee, and I like how they just stuck one in that window as well. Um, but this is say the Jasper decorators, and they have named all these people down at the bottom, and that's a really nice family resource because I do get inquiries from people saying, you know, my great great grandfather used to work for Wedgwood, what did he do? And I would go away and say, well, actually, we've got a picture of him from this time, so that's a really nice thing to share with people. 
Um, we also have quite an important role um, the museum and the archives as well today um, for the general running of the business. So I get a lot of requests from the design department and they come down quite frequently to peruse the Wedgwood pattern books, of which we have hundreds of them. This is the very first Wedgwood pattern book, and um, so the very first Wedgwood design is thin blue line. But as you go on, the patterns do get slightly more adventurous. But even today, um, the company will come down and they'll lift designs from the 18th century pattern books and then reproduce them on modern wear. If any of you have been into the um, flagship store, you might have seen this very brightly coloured plate called a Wonderlust. All of those designs were taken directly from the um, museum archive and then to be coloured for a modern audience. And I was involved in that in my own small way. And that was a really exciting project for us to be involved with. So again, we're still relevant to the business um, you, oh, did I get that right around? Um, so, in terms of the Wedgwood Museum, I won't touch too much, of course, because I know that uh, both John and John want to be looking at this a little later on. Um, but today, the Wedgwood Museum collection um, is owned by the VA, and I won't say much more than that. So, today, I am an employee of the company Wedgwood. Um, but I answer and look after a collection that's housed by, um, well, it's owned by the VA, but housed here on long term loan. So that's how that sort of relationship works. And I'll happily answer any questions about that a little bit later on as well if those arise. We have a lot of uh, very strong local links um, with various universities in the area as the museum. So one of them is at Keele University, who's a relationship we have that's quite strong as well, is with Stafford University, so again, two local institutions. Um, we have student groups come in, we engage with students, but we engage with children from about the age of four onwards, um, especially with the sort of curriculum um, around it. The curriculum nowadays is focused much more on local history. We play a role in sort of teaching people, engaging children with history in the area. Um, just a couple more things of items that we have in our collection. It's just a random page of um, catalogues of wear, which includes um, original price lists down the side, so I get notifications in and they ask me what they are. Um, another page from the Wedgwood Pattern Books, which again is, is rather nice. Um, this is again just a selection of some of the items um, just in our pattern book room. So there are over 300 pattern books. Um, in the Wedgwood archives, and that isn't just for Wedgwood, they are subsidiary companies as well that the company has taken over um, throughout the last sort of 50 60 years or so, and they are all housed here as well in um, specialist conditions. Um, we have a lot of design papers as well. So, this was one of the original plans for this very factory that you can sort of see out the window behind you when it was originally touted as an idea to be built in 1936. Um, so, the company was moving out of the community <coughs> and it went into fresh air. So, unfortunately, this was never built um, because of the outbreak of the Second World War. Um, but I think it's a really nice example of what else we have in our collection. Um, and again, we can tell a lot of social history. So this is a really nice image of um, Queen Elizabeth visiting us in 1955. And we said to her, what pattern would you like? And uh, this is her picking her pattern. This is um, Appledore. And um, apparently she still uses this in one of her palaces today. So we have lots of things for royalty. Um, but we also have sort of more day-to-day um, -day functional objects. So this is um, a shape called shape 225 which was actually designed by the design of the Coca-Cola bottle, as we now know it, Jerome Gould. But we have all of the original designs um, as well, just creating the shape, again, in our archive. And this does inform the way we sort of interpret our collection as well. And then, again, I did talk very quickly about this chat just a moment ago, but we do do a lot of social history as well here at the museum. We're not just about the ceramics and the pots. So one of the things that we've spent a lot of time over the last four years um, doing is a project looking at these soldiers from the First World War who were formerly employees here who went to go and fight. Um, there were 169 of them and we have over 300 letters from these men from back to the company sharing their experience of um, the war basically. Um, we have these letters from Cecil Wedgwood who is a gentleman who was killed on the Somme. Um, and again, he was writing letters back home explaining his you know, situation and his experience of war. 
So we, we're not just about pots, we can tell such a huge amount of um, stories from our collection. So thank you very much for that very brief sort of 15, 20 minute gallop through Wedgwood history. Um, I shall let John and John take start up again. But thank you very much for listening. This is my bit. I'm going to talk a little bit about donor motivation. Um, note that um, although this is a charitable collection, as Lucy said, it, it's, it's owned by the uh, Victorian Art Museum, which is itself a charity. It's now held on uh, a trust. And so this collection that you saw outside is, is, is held on a, on, on a trust. It's a trust if you do uh, equity with us. Um, um, so it's a charity. But it's not possibly what you think of in terms of charity or in terms of what you think of necessarily as donation. So I'm kind of shooing uh, my charity interests a little bit into this uh, context. But the law is the same. Uh, and then John's going to talk much more directly about uh, the law of this place, which is really very, very interesting. So, so the nature of gifts, um, when we think of gifts to charity, we tend to think uh, these days uh, in terms of humanitarian assistance. Um, or the relief of poverty, but of course that's not true because cultural collections uh, um, um, are also charitable. Um, also educational uh, purposes are charitable, uh, and so any gift like that can be charitable and therefore held on a charitable trust. And so that's what essentially we've got out there, we've got property held on the trust. That picture's uh, an old picture and it looks much less nice than it does now, I get it. I just lifted it up here today, you can probably tell me it's wrong. Right. <laughs> 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 um, so, of course, I know absolutely nothing about how you make parts, but those are killing us about. Um, but something that interests me, and something we're going to do in equity, is why people make gifts. So, humanitarian gifts, or uh, cultural gifts, or educational gifts. Um, and uh, uh, being an academic like John, so our job really is to be critical. Uh, so uh, when people are talking about gifts, people tend to have a kind of um, doe-eyed sort of admiration for people that are, are giving away their property. But my job is actually to be kind of critical and say, is it good or not? Um, and it isn't always. Sometimes it's really very vain and unpleasant. So this is a really fantastic case, um, uh, which you will uh, see very briefly in Equity McKellen University of Glasgow. And essentially, the landowner uh, uh, tried to, well, he did manage to build this in his lifetime, this great big kind of colosseum. <laughs> but on his death, he also uh, attempted to build statues of himself as a gift, as a gift to uh, the nation, um, build statues of himself in perpetuity. So the trust perpetually was going to keep building statues of himself all around his estate. So if, that's the first thing you can think about when you think about this, what's the motivation? Is it really kind? Is it really um, about other people, or is it, can it sometimes be vain? And I certainly don't think that this collection uh, is, is, is vain, uh, but sometimes uh, it can be. Um, museums and galleries have a charitable status. And uh, that's the Smithsonian in the USA that's founded a charitable gift in a will. <coughs> in a will. Um, and a lot of uh, organisations have a mix of donation support um, of, uh, from, from private individuals, um, and from uh, people like us coming to visit and, and, and pay, and sometimes memberships, um, uh, but also the state, and that's really, really very important. So a lot of museums and galleries of groups, Smithsonian in, in, in Washington, uh, actually get funded by the state. So when you think about what's charity, what's a charitable trust, uh, keep that in mind as well. It's not always private action, quite often it's the state uh, behind it. So you get these separate bodies, these separate organisations that also get state money. 
Um, just in the case law, um, you get people um, quite often trying to establish uh, museums kind of in their image. Now, the really interesting thing about the Wedgwood collection, of course, is that it really is culturally valuable. It's something uh, that's very important, that's kept together, as John's going to speak about. Uh, it's valuable and, uh, for, for the nation, um, and um, it's of historic importance. But this, and this is just something to talk about, um, is that people sometimes think their property is like that when it isn't. So the opinion is a nice famous case that we're going to do in the uh, next semester. Um, and in the opinion, uh, someone tried to leave their house to the nation, full of their collection of tat and brick and bric And they claimed that this was a charitable trust, that it could be held on charitable trust uh, for the nation. Um, and yeah, that's actually the same in the Australian case uh, with Britain. In the opinion, the judge uh, uh, actually just described it as a massive joke and said that that wasn't allowed. So interestingly, in, in the law, there's a kind of a quality requirement if you're going to leave property uh, to the nation. And of course, the Wedgwood collection passes that very, very easily. We could have very much like the opinion. It just shows how discretionary these cases can be. This is a domestic house. It's someone trying to set up uh, a, a museum of their own house. It's just an ordinary person with their own personal artifacts. In, it. in that one, uh, 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 the, the court actually says that's that perfectly valid. Something that's interesting, I think, is when people do uh, create collections uh, and such like, uh, or try and establish charities, um, one thing that often motivates them is a legacy. We've certainly got that with Wedgwood. We've got, the, we've got the name, we've got a kind of family association like Lucy was talking about. People are often very motivated by, because uh, uh, collections last forever, um, and so it's a kind of immortality that often motivates people when they're uh, doing this. Um, but just note sometimes then it gets a bit weird. So Wilson, um, 1913, guy tries to set up a school um, and he kind of does it and so this case fails that the, the court didn't allow it to be established. It fails because the uh, donor he sets he tries to set the timetable, he tries to uh, he says well uh, how much the staff are going to pay, he says precisely where it is, he just overdoes it, he just overdoes it. Um, so so many conditions attached to it that the trust just isn't workable. Lee Dominion's junior hold trust is a quite a pleasant case. Uh, and that's uh, uh, this uh, guy uh, who's a um, uh, financier. And he uh, established a student uh, hall in London, uh, but he attached a colour bar to it, so it's only white students of the British Empire. So you, so you can see people kind of mixing up their own values and their own traditions, sometimes with gigs. The court in 1947 uh, removed that colour bar. So, so the court intervened later uh, and, and sorted it out. But then no it gets, if you've got a private person uh, trying to uh, create a legacy, trying to uh, become in some way uh, immortal, uh, and then mixing in all their uh, funny feelings and politics and conditions, the court needs to regulate that in some way. The law needs to make sure it doesn't get too vain, it doesn't get too useless, and all the conditions that are attached to it are so much that it's just not worth holding for the value of everybody else. Or how long is it? Let's go straight to the job. So, uh, if, if anyone wants to talk about this at the end, oh, no, we'll do that. Yeah, yeah. Shall we? Yeah. Okay, so just, just very quick note. So, just the person next to you, will you just say, do you think donors should be able to attach conditions to their gifts? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>
stripping away like we're given a gift to like give you free will to choose what to do with it and by taking away that then you kind of defeat the whole object of having a gift because they can't choose what they want to do with it. It's no longer a gift if you do that. Oh that's interesting. No no a gift is you attach conditions and the law certainly allows you to attach conditions. And not only attach conditions but do it in that perpetuity yeah. you know, forever. Yeah. Um, I think it's just because it's a gift, and therefore it's done and done. You're not paying for anything, so if I tell you to take it, just shut up and take it. <laughs> <laughs> well, you can not take it. Yeah, I'll not take it, that's yeah. it. Yeah, I think, yeah, you can, you can attach conditions. Yeah. Oh. Okay. Oh, that's very interesting. Sorry, I'm a team job. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, right, so I'm going to talk about the negative end of things, I'm like the depressing uh, last person. Not really, because all I'm going to try and suggest perhaps is that the law should reflect that which the humans who have created it intended. And as we'll see, sometimes things happen that causes those kinds of positive outcomes not to be achieved. So, unless you've been hidden away in reading public law or some other subject that stopped you, you have to think about reading newspapers, you'll have noticed, if you have been reading this press, that over late a lot of charities have gone into a consultancy procedure. So, generally speaking, a procedure that's designed, of course, to dissipate the assets of that <coughs> entity, whatever it is, like Wedgwood, for example, um, generally amongst its creditors. Uh, and of course we might say that that distribution is inconsistent with what a charity is trying to achieve. If it's keeping that collection together or some other charitable purpose under the uh, Section 3 of the 2011 Charities Act. So it's that imbalance, that's that need to placate creditors in certain circumstances against the wider public purposes of what charities are for that I'll address very, very briefly. So there are some. You'll have heard of kids' companies soon. John and I have done a piece that's on the, the stocks in relation to how the directors of the kids' company behave. So are you familiar with Camilla Batman Jenny, the lady who wears the big flowery dresses and stuff? She's basically in deep trouble. So uh, we'll see what happens soon in the press on kids' company. But for today, today we'll just mull on Wedgwood. Why is it an issue? <coughs> well, this smorgasbord, look, there are 12 options that uh, an intending donor, to which John has spoken, can select in terms of a legal fiction or device through which to administer their charity. So you, broadly speaking, when John gives his lectures in a couple of weeks' time, will be looking at the charitable trust so a public purpose trust, as opposed to a private purpose trust or an express trust. The problem that some charities have is that on occasion, like Wedgwood did in 1962, or their solicitors, is that they decide not to use the trust instrument that we're all familiar with, that express trust, but instead they incorporate a company to administer that charity. 
Uh, so that's option four out of this whole group that, that they might select. So, of course, the problem that then occurs is that unlike a normal trust, where does legal title sit with a normal express trust, anybody? This is for a prize of another suite on the way back. Where does legal title sit in a normal express trust? The trustee. Excellent, yeah. So if that trust in some way gets into difficulties, the onus of responsibility is on who? The trustee, isn't it? Yeah. But if the assets are not owned by the trustee with the legal title, the legal title instead sits with a company, of course it's the company that is then responsible and has those assets. And therein lies the problem that we need to address. So, which vehicle? Wedgwood, unfortunately, as I say, in 1962 selects the separately interested person. Briefly, I want to tell you that you might think this is a huge problem. Well, unfortunately, none of the statistical work on it uh, show us that to what extent there are insolvent charities out there. Although, of course, because of the slide that I've already shown you, we know that there are. So these are the two regulators of this area that we're looking at, the Insolvency Service and, of course, the Charity Commission. As you can see from their responses, we don't even know really how many insolvent charities there are. But uh, we can say that somewhere buried in that lot there are definitely insolvent charities. So, let's have a look at some cases. All of these cases, broadly speaking, relate to the type of trust that was extant here, or the type, type of charity, I should say, at Wedgwood. So they're all cases where legal title is held by the company, so by a juristic person, not a charitable trust in each sense. So, I want to put a vote to you now. If the company, whichever one it is, like Wedgwood for example, gets into financial difficulty, let's say it owes its pension fund 126 million and therefore it is uh, technically insolvent. That's what happened here at Wedgwood. So, the, the pension fund was owed that amount of money. 126 million. Should the assets of Wedgwood be used to placate that exposure, 126 million, or should instead they still be used for the purpose for which they were given, namely charity, keeping that collection together as an important, nationally important, indeed internationally important, as Lucy's told us, that, that that collection stays together. So hands up if you think it should go to the pension fund and level creditors. Anyone? So should it go to pay off creditors? One person who is a banker by profession. Good. Uh, and I, with, with a bean, of course. Uh, uh, hands up if you think they, that the asset should stay in that general charitable purpose way that I've tried to explain. Good. So John does. Lucy definitely does. And most people do, yeah. Okay, let's briefly look at these cases. <coughs> so there are 11 potential trusts in Reed Fingers Well Trust. Um, some were two gifts, rather, I should say. So we've got 11 gifts that were made by the testatrix. Uh, and of those gifts, some were to incorporated entities, so companies, and some were to normal trusts, so charitable trusts. I'll just deal with the incorporated entities. Briefly, what occurred in Fingers was that the, the constitution, the way in which that trust instrument had been drafted, was held by the judge to be sufficiently wide to allow that asset value to continue to be used for the purpose of charity. Even though, on the face of it, of course, <coughs> the assets are owned by the company and should go to placate creditors. So for us, in our balance of well, where does that value go, figures is a good case. Then we get to local interest. So this hospital is no, no longer a hospital. Uh, it's, uh, it's a group of houses, John was telling me earlier, over on the wheel, uh, but it was a very important heart research hospital back in its day, which was given some money uh, uh, for two purposes, one to help people with heart problems and one for research. The National Health Service took over many hospitals in the 1950s, including this one, meaning that the value that was left for research was still extant and not taken into the NHS, but was still floating around. So the question was, in this case, 
from Mr. Justice Slade. Should the money go to the company's shareholders, its members, or, in the alternative, should it still be held for some general charitable purpose for which it was originally given? It's in the original intention. Slade held that the money should uh, first blush because of it, the fact that it was owed by the company, the, the, the asset value research funds, should go to the members. So that gets diverted away from charity. However, he then looks at the constitutional document of the company and sees that there's a specific clause that says on the advent of insolvency of these issues, that money should then be diverted to a new entity, something called, or a device called C Prey, which is uh, law French for the idea of something near. So in other words, we'll divert those research funds to another charity that does the same kind of activity as this one did before the NHS took it over. So both of these cases are helpful so far, aren't they? They both involve companies, as charitable companies, and they both involve techniques to help save that value for charity, don't they? This one, of course, it was a general charity intention, and this one, it was a constitutional provision that allowed that uh, diversion. It takes us to the most important case. So as I've already told you, 2009, which would have some difficulties, some administrators were appointed, so they'd come along in their car and literally walk into the building over their takeover. Walk in, go, all right, chaps, guys, we're on board now, we're in charge, you're 126 million, what have you got here that we can use to placate the creditors, the pension fund, the creditors amongst others? Oh, look, there's an 18 million pound museum with lots of important assets. Let's take that and let's use that value. We've already had a vote on this issue. Most of you said, no, don't do that, that's naughty. Or no, particularly Lucy would think that was naughty. Don't do it. Um, it goes up before his honour judge, Pearl QC, uh, in the Chancery Division, who has to decide, uh, 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 as Lucy said earlier when we first met, between the pension rights of those employees, who are after all important, aren't they? You can't do over uh, pensioners, can you, in some way, to placate general charitable purposes. So it's the pension rights versus, of course, this general idea of keeping together, perhaps, the, the Wedgwood Museum and its archive. Or, if we had a time machine, we, we to go back and tell that solicitor in 1962 to not use a corporate form, wouldn't it? Just use a charity. Because you've given us a whole heap of trouble, haven't you? Uh, goes before Pearl, hands up if you think he said the money should go to the creditors. So hands up if you think Pearl said the money goes to the creditors, the pension fund. <laughs> hands up if you think Pearl said, oh hang on, look, we've got these earlier cases where he salvaged the charitable purpose. Perhaps we'll try and use those in some way. Hands up, therefore, the charity was saved. Hands up if you think the charity was saved. Purpose. Okay, that's the end of my talk. Uh, we can get some joking. <laughs> so he actually held that the pension fund won out. So that's to say the assets are held by the company, this charitable company, although it's of course not profit wealth maximizer, it's a charity. Nevertheless, the legal title still sits with the company, both legally and beneficially. Meaning those assets, these very important objects through the door there, are available for the creditors. So 2009 through to 2011, this is all litigated. The outcome, of course, is all that could be sold off to placate the pension fund. But as Lucy's already told us, of course, the Victoria uh, uh, and Albert Museum step here that I suppose bought the collection. No, so the art fund were, they step in very, very quickly. They were really good at doing that. I mean, they gave themselves a target of three months to raise the money. Uh, they actually finished raising money in three weeks, so Greg was a response from the public and local businesses. Um, but people from the factory could be down with you know, tons of loose change giving us money for it, so I was here at the time. Um, 
the art form is a charity, they can't legally hold items. So if they held it for one minute and they donated it to B and A Museum, so it can be held in the collection. So excellent. Yeah. So in terms of uh, well, assets, we know of course that, that they are safe for that general charitable purpose, despite the inappropriate form perhaps that was used. Go back to my original point by way of conclusion then, in terms of that tension about the vehicle that we've used, the device, the legal fiction that we've used as compared with what we're trying to achieve, namely a general charitable purpose, we see that there is an imbalance that but for the new benefactors that we've seen John have talked to uh, would have meant that that asset value was dissipated, which of course is problematic. Could be. Okay, any questions broadly on what I've covered here? Um, so what's the, what's the benefit then of using the court the corporate form of charitable trust? Is it that it's just going to be a limited liability for the trust? So corporate forms, yeah, so uh, limited liability, so you're it depends which form you use. So back in our big list of forms, you will see that some have limited liability. So this one does, for example, so the one that Wedge would use. So it was, a, it was the group of companies back in 1962, there was a group of Wedgwood companies. It was the case that the charitable company was the last company standing within the group. And the permanent uh, pension regulations meant that all responsibility then fell on that company. Um, so it, 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 there's some suggestion that it's at the whim of the solicitor at the time as to which of these structures is used as opposed to a carefully thought through uh, idea of which one would you, uh, you'd use for the qualities that perhaps you're talking to. So limited liability, of course protection, more secrecy than if um, uh, perhaps you used other structures as well in terms of how you uh, use your activity. But of course some of the other touristic persons are not having limited liability features either, so these two don't. Um, so, and then others, it could be uh, the kind of ideas that John talked to in his paper also, the idea of you know, public perception, so royal charters like the BBC, renewed every 10 years, you know, so the glamour of different forms of, of incorporation or usage. Um, but of, of late, of course, more specialist entities have developed that have qualities that perhaps are better suited to charities. Any other questions? Okay, well I've got some questions for you then. And the prizes for these questions are below me here. So when we were having lunch, John and I snuck into the museum. Lucy didn't notice and we liberated these four. <laughs> so you can now win these four pieces. They're, they're actually three pieces of um, Wedgwood. And we've got Lucy to authenticate this. And in fact, it isn't Wedgwood. So I'll just throw that away. But, uh, but I won't. That's John's actually from his private collection. Won't you? Um, that's an uh, incredibly rare pot. Okay. So for this piece of um, gasware, yep. uh, the, the hope, well, you never know. It could be worth millions. That's going all to do. So uh, do you want to give us a quick rundown of what that is? So it's a 1986 plate of a speakless treaty. Jasper. Well, keep that, keep that. <laughs> so the question for this, so if you want to win this, ready? This is the question. Which battle was Lucy's research subject killed in? Your hands. Yeah, excellent, well done. You're close. Right, so you're right up to the first hand as well. Right, so the next piece of hopefully bona fide day, uh, Yeah, back in 1974. Why? Well, that's, uh, that's brilliant. So that one, um, what year was the first day of production at Wedgwood, that factory? Lucy referred to it, and the first day vases were created? So it's in 1906. Not someone else? 1976. Oh, 1767. No. No. No, it's going to get warmer. Yeah, you're getting warmer. <laughs> Okay, I'll do another one then. Um, what was the name of the judge in the Wedgwood case that I referred to? Someone said Pearl. Pearl, yeah, well done. Yeah, so Pearl, 1974. <laughs> <laughs> and then hopefully this last piece of. Uh, Not in the Oh, Posey, was that for flowers? Yeah. yeah, cool. 61, 1961. Oh, right. Sixty-one. I thought we all need some more. Sixty-one. 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 Sixty-one.
be you know, the museum. <laughs> um, but, uh, but what shape number did Lucy refer to? Was it a coffee pot or a teapot? A coffee pot. The shape number? 251. No, something else. 225? Three. No, yeah, 225. <laughs> so, sorry about the whistle stop nature of our, um, our talks, but basically we've got shopping to do, so well done, Drew. Uh, so, any questions to me, John, or Lucy about anything that we've briefly covered? Okay, John and I have got full papers, so if you want to read the full papers, you, we can email them to you as well. But just remain to us, thank John for organising it, and Lucy also does.